Thank you, Ruti, for being with us today. I had the pleasure of meeting with you and your colleagues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in December. It was a good, good meeting, and our contact in every respect has been really beneficial, interesting, productive. We look forward to staying in touch with you um, and seeing one another, not just over Zoom, but face to face when the opportunity presents itself, hopefully this summer. Um, for those of you who do not yet know our speaker, you're in for a treat. She knows a great deal about the subject she'll be talking uh, with us about today. Uh, Ruth Kohendar was born in the Negev. Uh, after serving for three years in the Israeli military, she studied political science at the Hebrew University, taking two degrees with her from that important institution. She's worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for a number of years, uh, having been posted, among other places, to Austria, America, and her last post as Deputy Ambassador in Poland. Importantly, she holds the position of Director of the Department for Combating Antisemitism and Holocaust Remembrance at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Jerusalem. She's also the co-chair of Israel's delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. The subject she's going to speak with us uh, about today is vitally important, in fact, to anyone interested in uh, what's happening, especially in hostile terms, with regards to Jews and the Jewish state. Uh, her subject will be Israel's role in the fight against anti-Semitism. We're sure to learn a lot. Ruti, it's now my pleasure to turn over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elving, and thank you for having me. It's an honor for me to speak on this uh, platform, especially in light of the long list of very important people who spoke before me. Uh, so it's an honor to be here, and thank you for everyone for tuning in. Um, I will uh, share a short presentation in a minute, uh, but before that, I would like just to give you an idea of, um, of what am I going to speak about. And first, I would like you to know that um, this is an issue that is important for me. I applied for this position. I wanted to have it. And I think it's really important uh, for Israel uh, to be involved uh, in combating anti-Semitism. It is rooted in a very, very deep and important commitment of the state of Israel towards Jews in the diaspora. And it's being manifested in more than one way, uh, this commitment. So it's a moral and personal uh, uh, interest of my own in this topic. So we're going to talk in general on the trends of anti-Semitism, general trends that we recognize and uh, how we see them. We'll have a peak at 2022. I'm not going to drill down into the data or, or anything like that. You can go online and find all the big reports uh, one of the recent one was uh, ADLs uh, that gave a very good picture of what's going on. Then we'll take a look at directions and, and trends that are happening. Uh, I'll focus mainly on the US, but talk a little bit about Europe as well. And of course, we'll give a lot of time to how we operate, why we operate, and what is the logic behind what we do as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Israel and our involvement in combating anti-Semitism. And of course, we'll leave time for your questions. Hopefully, everything I'll say will be clear and there will be no questions. But I'm here to answer your questions uh, gladly. And can I uh, share my presentation, Gunther? Thank you. Um, OK, oops, not doing. Uh, oh, it's not doing what I want it to do. OK, now it's doing. Okay, can you see it? Yes, very good. Good. Um, so we'll start, as I said, with some general remarks and then we'll drill down uh, to 
the rest of the things, but it seems okay. So, in general, we see in last year's two maybe parallel, not meeting uh, trends uh, around the world, not only in specific countries, but around the world in general. And these are, uh, one of them is negative, you see it in red, and one of them is positive, of course. I'll start with the positive. We see um, a higher uh, awareness and higher understanding that anti-Semitism is a big problem. It's a social problem. It's something that needs to be addressed. And uh, we see that through um, the way leaders are speaking about it, the very clear messages that they're giving the public. We see it through legislation. We see it through action and through uh, more assertive uh, look at the problem of anti-Semitism. Uh, we see a very big development in legislation, not only in Europe, but in other parts of the world that addresses hate crimes and specifically anti-Semitism. We see resolutions in parliaments that are calling on various levels uh, to address the issue. And this is a very, very important development. Uh, we, of course, see uh, national strategies as well as um, beyond national strategies like the EU strategy for combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. Uh, and this strategy is also drilling down, trickling down to the EU member countries. And we see already, if I'm not mistaken, 14 uh, states that are members of the EU already have national strategies and have started uh, to present them. We also see a conversation in the US about the need to create a strategy to deal with the problem of anti-Semitism. And of course, the one of the most important tools that we have in our hands is the IRA definition for anti-Semitism. And we see it getting more and more um, uh, understanding that this is a very important tool. More and more countries are adopting it as the, the a national tool for uh, identifying anti-Semitism. And of course, uh, local authorities, uh, institutions, academic uh, culture, sports institutions, and others. We have about, as I said, 40 countries that have already adopted it and over 1,200 institutions around the world who have uh, adopted the IRA definition. Uh, we also see a pushback against IRA definition, which means it's a working tool. And, and where uh, we uh, see it as a very important uh, development. Um, we also see a very important development in the Abraham Accords. We see a different type of atmosphere starting to come up, not only in the Gulf, but also in Morocco, but in other countries as well. We see it affecting, we see a ripple effect. Just uh, this week, uh, I saw um, a recent work done by an organization called Impact SE. They took a look at uh, textbooks and educational system in Egypt and how the, the treatment of what is a Jew and Judaism and, of course, what is Israel is being addressed in those textbooks. And uh, there is a very, very important improvement in those textbooks. And, of course, there are improvements in uh, in educational systems in the Gulf area and in Morocco. So this is on the positive side, on the negative side of, for what is the challenges that we see. Uh, we see a very intense and very clear increase in the number of incidents around the world, but not only in the number, but also in the endangerment. We see more and more violent acts and especially um, Jews who look like Jews, meaning Haredi Jews who have, you know, the, the hair and uh, the black attire. They are visible on the streets and they are targeted in high numbers more than others. So this is a real serious problem. We see also um, a decrease in the age when uh, a person comes across anti-Semitism, meaning it's not only adults, it's also and not only students in, in university, but also uh, kids in high school and even in primary school as well. There is there is already a beginning of, of uh, this phenomena targeting Jewish kids on primary schools. 
we see um, the digital sphere, social media is playing a very important role in spreading hate speech and uh, malicious and toxic contents. And this is a very big challenge because you don't have to be where the content is created. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be exposed to it wherever you are from any uh, gadget that you're using in order to access the internet. We see, um, of course, the political polarization is an issue we'll talk about in a minute in more expand, uh, expand way and um, the normalization of the anti-Semitic uh, discourse. Uh, it's a kind of a mainstreaming. It's allowed to speak out and be anti-Semitic when uh, in the past it was not politically correct. It's okay now to be an anti-Semite. It's on social media. Celebrities are using tropes. Um, political figures are using uh, anti-Semitic tropes and just over the weekend, the Guardian has published a very, very malicious caricature of uh, the director of the BBC. He's, he's a Jew, and of course, they used a kind of caricature that would not shame um, the the uh, propaganda of the Nazi regime. So these are the two trends, the main trends of the last few years, and we're going to dive in for uh, what 2022 looked like. Um, and uh, if we take a look at, uh, at the general picture, uh, according to the reports that we saw here in Israel, there is a very slight decline between 2022 to 2021. But we need to remember that on 2021, we had uh, the, the Gaza Strip um, uh, conflict and that uh, instigated really a serious wave of, uh, of anti-Semitism all over the world, even in places that we didn't expect it to be, like in Canada, where it's rare and, and it became very, very apparent during that, uh, that um, crisis. And since then, it's there. But on the other hand, in the US, we see an increase in the, um, in the number of uh, anti-Semitic incidents. Um, if we it's not moving forward, just a second, let's see. Well, doesn't, oh, okay. If we take a look at the main uh, incidents that we saw uh, during, the, during the 2022, uh, so in the US we saw, according to the ADL uh, survey, 3,700 incidents. It's a 25 and a 25% increase in uh, in violent attacks. Uh, so um, this is something that is very important that we need to have in mind. The most uh, significant incident that still has a rippling effect uh, since then is the Kanye West incident on, on Twitter that had also manifested itself in the physical world and really, really proves what we say all the time, that what starts on the digital sphere never stays there. It spills over to the physical sphere, sphere and manifests itself in, in, um, in sometimes very violent attacks against Jews. Uh, in France, three Jews were murdered last year. Um, the, the authorities didn't always attribute it to anti-Semitic motives, but it was very clear. Uh, the motivation was very clear, even though it wasn't defined by the authorities like that. And this is something that we'll talk in a minute, this gap between commitment, legislation, and what happens on the ground. Uh, in Germany, out of everywhere, we had attack, a physical attack on a rabbi's home in, in Essen, but we also had Abu Mazen, the president of the Palestinian Authority, standing in front of a room full of journalists next to the chancellor of Germany, saying that uh, Israel has done 50 holocausts and nobody found the reason to correct what he said there in front of everyone in Germany out of everywhere. Uh, in the UK, we saw attacks on Jews in broad daylight in front of security cameras. It didn't uh, disturb the perpetrators to do that. In Italy, there was a very vicious attack on a, 
and a politician who is the leader of the left of the opposition. She, is, she has a Jewish heritage. I think her father's side is Jewish. She does not define herself as Jewish, but all the attacks were attacking her Jewishness, if I can uh, call it this way. Um, so um, one thing before we move to directions and changes and talk about uh, how we see it, I would like to talk about this gap between what I said, the commitment, the investment, national strategies, uh, legislation, and what happens on the ground. There is a kind of a black hole between the government level or the governing level and what happens in general public, because everywhere you go and you see legislation is in foot and you see commitment from leaders, not always you see that being um, reflected on what happens on the public, uh, sometimes the opposite. You see an increase, you see a very strong anti-Semitic atmosphere, and this is a black hole we need to find a way to close uh, or at least to minimize as much as possible. One of the biggest reasons, I think one of the biggest uh, factors here uh, is social media. And of course, uh, other uh, factors are affecting that. Um, and we'll talk in a minute about what, what I see we can do as Israel on that, on that uh, uh, issue. Um, so, did I just increase the size of the of the slide? Uh, yes, you did. How do I how do I make it normal? Go to escape, probably. Okay, let's see. Okay, yes, thank yeah. you, thank you very much. It, the mouse here is very sensitive. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, so let's talk about directions and changes which affect the, the anti-Semitic uh, atmosphere or anti-Semitism, the phenomena of anti-Semitism. This affects how we see it and how we see our role in addressing this, uh, this phenomena. Um, in, we see, first of all, in uh, political and social changes uh, do affect the atmosphere and do create sometimes an atmosphere of that enables anti-Semitic uh, anti-Semitism to rise up. We saw it very well with um, I'm taking a very very narrow example uh, to avoid politics, uh, but we saw it very clearly with uh, the acquisition of Twitter by Elon Musk. There is a very interesting survey or, or research done by an institute called NCRI. They've checked what happened with anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic content on the platform before, during, and after the acquisition of Twitter by Elon Musk. And there is a real hike in anti-Semitism and in anti-Semitic uh, content on the platform during that period of time and ever since then. This is a platform that enables of course, there are no content moderators in, on Twitter, so you can report until tomorrow. The content is still there. Uh, so social change and the effect on uh, what happens with uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, in, in, the, in the US, we see it very clearly. We see it also in Europe, but in the US, it's very apparent. The whole uh, world of content of progressive discourse, this woke and intersectionality, and um, a narrative of of victimization, this um, crossing paths between um, very extreme Islamist Muslim Brotherhood supporters and very extreme. Uh, leftists who are liberals, who support human rights, who work for climate change and, and this whole world of, of ideology, they cross paths and there is this red-green alliance, which is really impossible to understand how this alliance can be, but it happens around Jews and Israel. And this is something to look at and to, to work on uh, in order to combat this phenomena, because at the end of the day, it affects Jews on the streets, in their workplace, in school, and in university and wherever they are. It, 
it might start with uh, hiding behind the position regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at the end of the day it targets Jews in America, in Germany, in France, it doesn't matter where they are. And this is a very twisted way of thinking, especially from people who are uh, human rights fighters and, and thinking about uh, basic freedoms and basic rights, just not for uh, Jews. Um, we see uh, attributing to Jews uh, um, characteristics of white supremacy, the white power, Jews belong to the ruling powers. So this whole uh, look at Jews as white and protected and not really a minority that needs protection and anti-Semitism is not a problem for those people. Uh, there is usually um, pointing a finger towards the other side. It's not only from the left to the right, to the extreme right, but also from the extreme right to the left. Everybody sees the the other side as the as the bad people in the story. So we see the extremes grow and the center is growing smaller. Uh, and this is a problem because center is something that uh, balances the discourse and we see it uh, very clearly that it's uh, shrinking and this is something that uh, we need to um, to take a look at. Regarding Islam and Islamism, we see, as I said at the beginning, also a positive uh, change. And this, please bear in mind, because this is something to build on. And this is the effect of the Abraham Accord on the discourse in some of the Gulf countries. In Morocco, this affects what goes out on social media and affects the Muslim communities that are, uh, are attentive to that uh, discourse around the world. So. Um, we look at also the business world. Uh, we can see this whole world of responsible, socially responsible investment, but through that, there is an infiltration to the workplace and to the business world of uh, anti-Semitic uh, sentiment. Uh, there are some uh, researchers that show that there are businesses who avoid hiring Jews in order not to get into that messy complex of the uh, working with Jews in their workplace. Uh, of course, we need to learn a new language, uh, especially when we talk about this uh, leftist, but also when we try to understand the extreme right, because they have a covered language. So we need to understand the language in order to identify what we are facing and what we're dealing with. And uh, last uh, but not least, which is really important and is the positive development is of course the strategies national and other level of strategies. There is a conversation now in the UN uh, to present uh, a strategy for the UN agencies uh, re with regards of combating anti-Semitism. And of course, taking the IRA definition as a basis for it will help not only strengthen the IRA definition, but also help to push forward uh, the uh, abilities of combating anti-Semitism on many levels. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing this um, strategy come to come to life and present it. Of course, the UN arena is a really problematic arena uh, because of how it functions and how it works. There are certain areas like the Human Rights Council or others that uh, prefer the politicizing of the discourse instead of really working on the issues that they are uh, that they are responsible for. Uh, we see absurd uh, situations where Syria gets to uh, preside in the Human Rights Council, where everybody knows what happens in Syria, or Iran is part of it when Iran plays a really major role in violating human rights. So this is something that uh, we are looking at, we're working very hard on. It's a very tough um, terrain. It's like a, a very thick wall that we need to tear down, but we're still thinking how to do that. One last word is about Iran. Iran is a very, very uh, major player in spreading anti-Semitism. Uh, if you just go on Khamenei's Twitter account, you see all the good old propaganda from Gable's time and the Soviet Union time. Uh, you see the, the caricatures, you see the language, 
you see the attributions and of course the call to uh, annihilating uh, Israel. Okay, I think we talk. Yeah. Oh, one more thing in our uh, last cha social change. Um, I would like to just put here a thought in your in your mind. I think it's more apparent in the US, but it exists also in some of the European countries. It's kind of a mainstreaming of Islamism or or uh, Islamist groups. And, and there is a very strong uh, work on delegitimizing uh, Jewish communities and Jewish organizations. And this is something that we need to uh, think about how to best tackle, because this creates a problem, not only when we come to deal with um, anti-Israel discourse, it really targets Jewish communities and the legitimization of Jewish communities. It goes back to the discourse that uh, sees Jews as part of the white supremacist um, part of society. So let's talk about uh, Israel's role. Um, and yeah, uh, let's talk about Israel's role. Um, the first and foremost, it's the commitment and the moral obligation. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's part of our resonance, uh, our um, vision of why we're doing what we're doing. We have the Ministry of Diaspora, uh, who is responsible to the relationship between Israel and the diaspora and the Jews around the world. And our ministry works through 108 embassies all over the world. Every diplomat in our core uh, knows that when they land everywhere, the first thing they do is connect to the Jewish community, listen to the leadership, listens to what their needs are and how to best uh, work with uh, the Jewish communities. Uh, so this is part, not only part of our job description, it, it is part of our moral obligation toward Jews in around the world. We have a whole division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, I'm part of it. My department is just one of uh, four uh, departments. There is a department that is responsible to Jewish communities and Jewish organizations. They're working closely with other Jewish organizations. Uh, there is a department that works with world religions, um, meaning the cooperation between uh, Jews and other religions, not only in Israel, but also outside of Israel, which is very important. We'll talk about it in a minute. And uh, we have a special envoy that works on restitution uh, of property from the time of the Holocaust. So this is our um, division. It's part of the public diplomacy uh, uh, bureau and it's um, working directly under the director general of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Just to give you an idea, every year there are 10 goals that uh, mark the work plan of all our ministry uh, in our headquarters and also in our embassies. Number seven every year for the last three or four years is combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. It's part of the goals of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So this is uh, to show the obligation and commitment of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. How we do it, uh, as I said, every diplomat knows how to connect to the Jewish community. We work with Jewish communities. We also uh, connect to uh, civil society organizations, wherever we are. We do a reach out to other minorities uh, in those countries in order to connect and work together with other minorities on the challenges that are common to Jewish communities and to those uh, minorities. We see that as a power denominator and it helps us uh, take the word uh, forward, the work forward, not only us, but also the Jewish communities. Uh, and of course, we do um, on regular basis dialogues, uh, political dialogues with uh, organizations, but al also with certain countries. We have just had a dialogue with the EU, with the, with the commission. In the commission, there is a special team that works on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life. We have a long-standing relationship with that team and we have a yearly dialogue. We just had one uh, at the, uh, two weeks ago. We had a, a dialogue with Germany, with Switzerland, with France, of course, and we're planning one with the UK. 
with the US, we're trying to uh, establish one that will go, uh, though our dialogue is uh, on a daily basis with the US, um, especially with the team of uh, Professor Deborah Lipstadt. So we have dialogue with governments, but our embassies have also dialogue with other authorities. So on local level, if it's in um, a district or a, a city hall or any other type of uh, regional uh, authorities, uh, our embassies reach out and try to create this discourse that helps uh, make it more clear how important it is to combat anti-Semitism and move the, the discussion on anti-Semitism from a Jewish problem to being a social problem and the responsibility of the country and the authority Jews are living under. Because at the end of the day, a French Jew lives in France and the French authorities are responsible to enable um, a secure and free and uh, basic life as if as for every other citizen. And this is something that we are uh, very much uh, putting it very high on our um, agenda when we are reaching out to authorities. Uh, the other uh, important uh, work that we're doing is building coalitions. Uh, we try to connect between uh, government level, civil society level, Jewish communities, Jewish organizations, but also on issues of the digital sphere and social media with the tech companies. We find this circle is a very effective one. It's just the beginning of it. We're just starting the discussion. It takes time, but sitting together in the same room and discussing the problems is a very important first step in order to find a way to work together. We already see a good ripple effect in the network of special envoys in some of the countries around the world, including the US. There are special envoys responsible for combating anti-Semitism. So this group of people is convening from time to time and also keeping in touch on a regular basis when there are issues that are occurring in of this or other type of issues. And we share information, we work together and we try to support each other uh, doing the work of combating anti-Semitism. So this is a very important uh, role uh, that we do. Um, and of course, uh, creating a platform for cooperation is very important. One of the major uh, platforms that uh, the State of Israel is doing is the Global Forum for Combating Anti-Semitism. It's a bi-yearly um, conference. We bring everybody to Israel, uh, all stakeholders, um, state uh, representatives and others. Uh, we convene for two, three days, depends on how much budget we have. Uh, but we we meet in Jerusalem and we discuss the various aspects of combating anti-Semitism. And I can tell you that out of these uh, meetups uh, come usually cooperations that we didn't expect. And uh, the last one was in 2021, and we hope to have the next one uh, by the end of this year. So people are coming together, sharing information, uh, working together. We also, through our dialogues vis-a-vis uh, -vis governments and other entities, uh, we share information about projects that we do in Israel, and we try to engage those governments and other entities to work with us together in order to improve our knowledge, our base of knowledge, but also our ability to create action items to better uh, work on this challenge of combating anti-Semitism. Uh, one more thing is the importance of religious leaders. We think religious leaders have a lot of effect even in this very secular world we live in. Still, religious leaders have uh, an effect and influence on their uh, followers. So through the Department for World Religions and other uh, mechanisms, we work vis-a-vis -vis religious leaders, maybe with our embassies engaging, churches or Muslim leaders, wherever they are, or us from the headquarters creating the opportunity and the platform for religious leaders to, to meet and take action. 
uh, just uh, lately, uh, the Conference of Churches has adopted, uh, the European Conference of Churches has adopted the IRA definition, which sends a very important message to the public of followers, how important combating anti-Semitism is, but also how do we define what anti-Semitism is? This is a very important message, and this is a way a religious leader uh, can influence uh, their followers. It's something uh, that we do. One more thing that we do is uh, we talk with uh, legislators, with politicians who are responsible for legislating about uh, legislation, if it exists in their country, uh, um, how to improve it, how to make it a better uh, legislation to tackle the challenge of anti-Semitism in a better way. Of course, when it comes to the digital sphere where uh, most of governments, if not all, are way behind the technology. Technology is far more advanced than us on that issues, and we need to be more diligent when we legislate against hate crimes and especially against anti-Semitism. I think a very important step here is the Digital Services Act of the EU, it's something that I can expand on uh, when we speak uh, further on, if you're uh, interested. Of course, uh, we promote um, the IRA definition. We do everything we can to make sure this is the definition people are using, uh, not only uh, saying they're adopting it, but also implementing it when coming to address uh, the issue of anti Semitism, because it's not. Uh, only, uh, it's not only good to say that you are against anti-Semitism, you have to take the measures in order to confront it. And the first step is defining the, the phenomena or what you see in order to better tackle this, um, this issue. Uh, projects, what we do, um, we usually engage uh, and other entities, for instance, this year we are engaging the, the National Security Institute, Research Institute, the INSS, and we're doing a big project taking a look at the image of Jews in Israel in the Arab Muslim world and how it affects uh, Muslim communities around the world, because whatever happens in the Arab world does not stay there. It affects Muslim communities in the uh, Western and other countries, and this has direct effect on Jews in those countries. So we're trying to build our knowledge bases to take a look at the positive uh, developments with the Abraham Accords and the uh, change in the atmosphere, but also what are the challenges and where we should invest more in order to better tackle this uh, phenomena. We're trying to take a look at uh, how to better monitor and collect data. We engage, of course, with the ADL and what they're doing. We engage with other research institutes. We engage academia. We work with Yad Vashem for sure. They are our uh, better half on uh, combating anti-Semitism and especially on Holocaust remembrance issues. I'll just devote one word to Holocaust remembrance because uh, the issue of uh, Holocaust and the history of the Holocaust, especially when it comes to Holocaust denial and distortion is part of our combat against anti-Semitism. So we engage on two important ways. One of them is encouraging legislation, of course, against uh, denial and distortion, working with social media platforms to remove content of, uh, of this kind, but also to promote positive content, meaning if somebody is looking to learn more about the Holocaust, they should come across uh, reliable uh, and uh, true to the facts uh, content rather than content that is uh, negative and promotes denial and distortion. And of course, we work with through our embassies with uh, educational systems, with education ministries around the world to promote education of the Holocaust. Though I have to tell you, just putting on the curricula um, the topic of learning about the Holocaust does not do the work of decreasing uh, anti-Semitism or um, not very effective in decreasing the issue of, uh, of distortion of the Holocaust. 
this this challenge is very complicated. I can expand on it uh, in a minute. I think I covered most of everything that I wanted to talk about. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer.